child properly educated in mass mm -hmm. is a serious threat to the overall maintenance of the American social order. If you prepare black children to be just as intelligent and academically proficient as white children, you are now preparing them to take all the freshman spots at Harvard, all the freshman spots at Yale. You're preparing them to take all of the spots in the law program, the medical program. So in order for America to remain America, which is based on white privilege and white supremacy, you have to engineer failure for black children in mass. Because if you understand the science of money, you can go broke and be rich again in a couple of years. But if you don't understand the science of money, you can be rich and broke in a few years. So when your child comes to my school, by the time they finish the ninth grade, they will understand the real estate market and how to master it. Uh -oh. By the time they get out to 12th grade, they will be able to do their own taxes. They will never have to go to H&R Block. They can do everybody's taxes on their own block. Hello. When they get out the 11th grade, your child will have their own business plan to start their own business. And by the time they graduate, they will have mastered the stock market, not just New York, but the one in China, Japan, London, and South Africa. It is an education for liberation. In my school, your child will have to master an academic discipline as well as an industrial trade. So you'll be a lawyer and a mechanic. You'll be a psychologist and a plumber. You know why? Dr. Umar, why are you wasting your time teaching them skills if he wants to go to law school? Because all the degrees that we get from college are degrees that only work if white people are looking to hire you. If they're not hiring you, you don't eat. And I need to make sure that boy can put food on that table, whether somebody needs a psychologist or not. I don't believe that black organizations who claim to be grassroots mm -hmm. should ever take money from the government or any other white philanthropist. Say that because one. when you do that, when you take funding from your oppressor, you become an agent of the oppression. Can you say that one more you time? You cannot walk the fence. Yeah. Say if that one more time. If you take the funding yeah. from the oppressor, then you become an agent of the oppressor. Yeah. Doesn't matter who you are. And that's why we have to make sure we stay economically independent. And I know it's difficult to raise money in the black community because we are not concerned about our condition. We're more concerned about looking better than each other mm -hmm. and keeping up with the latest material gap. But it's the only way to do it right. You cannot use your enemy's money to finance your revolution. The revolution will not be financed by the oppressor. And every city has them. Most of the folks you pointed to are members of the black bourgeoisie. And they come in five groups. The religious bourgeoisie. These are members of the black religious clique, be they Muslim, Christian, Jehovah Witness, or otherwise. Some of them might even be African traditionalists. And their job is to do what? Their job is to make you think that your problems are not due to white supremacy and racial discrimination, but rather due to the fact that you have somehow fallen out of favor with the Lord. Now, that's a very bad interpretation of reality, because if you think your problems are due to your religious mistakes, then you will never look to the system to be accountable for what's happening to you. So the job of the pastor is very key. And historically, the job of the church has always been very key as it relates to keeping people oppressed by making them think it's God who's doing the oppressing. The religious bourgeois. Oh. And I ain't just talking about the Christian leaders. Some of them are Muslim. Some of them practice traditional African religion. This includes all of them. Reverend Chicken Wing! <laughs> when you showed up to church on Sunday, when you showed up to the mosque on Friday, because I don't discriminate, they all guilty. That's right, that's you right. You were ready to get something done. You said these schools are miseducating our kids. We're going to make this pastor do something. Uh-oh. And then you walked in there, he took out the good book and found a little phrase in there that explained away his lack of accountability. Uh -oh. Yes.
selfish, opportunistic religious leaders who would dare use religion to explain away white supremacy. Okay. Who make you think that your problem ain't the social inequities in Minnesota, but rather the fact that you have fallen out of grace with the Lord. And the way you get back in favor with the Lord is to give away your money. Or the Arab gas station. The East Indian stop and go. You get mad at them for ciphering dollars and not putting nothing back. But what about the church? What? The church takes more money than all the stop and goes put together. And even though the ethnic minorities are guilty of robbing black folk, you do get something back. Whether it's a loaf of bread, a gallon of milk, <laughs> Some gas mixed with water. <laughs> you do get something. But when you give your money to the church, there is a zero return on your investment. So the next time somebody tell you the Lord needs your money, you collect all the money, put it in one big basket, you come to the middle of the aisle, and you say, Lord, I'm about to throw this money up, and whatever you need, you grab. <laughs> and whatever comes back down stays in the hood. All right. And then you have the higher education bourgeois. These are blacks who are principals, superintendents, uh, they are professors at the universities. Their job is to over intellectualize the problem and make you think that the reason you're in the condition you're in is because you keep on doing something wrong. So it doesn't have anything to do with white supremacy. It doesn't have anything to do with racism. It doesn't have anything to do with mass incarceration. The reason black men are going to jail, as they would argue, is because you're irresponsible, you don't wanna work, all you wanna do is play basketball, rap, and sell drugs, but they don't tell the truth of the matter. And the truth of the matter is that the mis-incarceration system rests upon a miseducation system. And if you want to incarcerate a given group of people, you have to first miseducate them. And so you deliberately seek to destabilize the education of black boys and girls, but especially the boys, so they can never be given an opportunity to earn a decent education. But I understand the structure of the American social order. And I know the way in which black behavior is maintained is by select group of gatekeepers who are strategically placed in different places to keep you in your place. And they come from five groups. One of them is the intellectual bourgeois. These are superintendents and principals and college professors. And some of them work in the Department of African American Studies, but it don't mean a damn thing. And their job is to do what? Do research studies. We've done studies to prove that the problem of the black male has nothing to do with white racism and everything to do with hip hop and single parenthood and poverty. That's a damn lie. And then you have the media bourgeois. These are blacks on TV, radio, newspaper, magazine. They got access to the airwaves and waste the whole show talking about Jay-Z's concert or Kanye West's new baby, Northwest North, whatever that is. This is what they do. Their job is to entertain you long enough for you to be exterminated. And then you got the economic bourgeois. These are blacks with a couple dollars. But they ain't never got a couple of dollars for your after school program. They ain't never got a couple of dollars for the rights of passage. They ain't never got a couple of dollars to improve the block. But whenever the Boys and Girls Club need a check, they can get it. When one of the fraternities need a check, they can get it. But when the hood needs a check, you can't get it. They use the money on everything but the right thing. So one thing we have to stop doing is allowing the social order to clump us in 
with everybody else. We don't have anything in common with any of these other groups, okay? All of them voluntarily chose to come to America and they can voluntarily leave and go back to a country at which they were once a citizen or resident. We don't have that type of a privilege. We're the only non-white people in the country who were forced to be here and we are the descendants of those who was forced to build this country for free. So there is no collective minority designation that I would allow myself to be identified with. And titles are very important because they help to shape reality. So when I'm speaking, I'm only speaking about African people. Now, if a Latino brother or sister embraces their African heritage and they're willing to accept that they are African as well, because most of them are, then I fight for them too. But if you want to set yourself apart from me and consider yourself to be something other than African, I don't want to be interested in that. How can you say the things that you say, mm -hmm. speak the truth that you speak, and receive some of that money from, let's just say, colleges, from school districts, and what have you, and still remain consistent in what you say to do? What, what, what do you have to do in your mentality to move past any fear of losing anything? I would say that for me, a long time ago, when I first got into this work, I recognized as I studied everyone who came before me, including my ancestor, Frederick Douglass, that you had to come to a point where you were willing to lose everything yes. for the ideal for which you stand. And if you're not willing to lose everything for the ideal for which you stand, then you're not totally committed to it. Yeah. And so for me, when I was working with the School District of Philadelphia, a position from which I resigned as school psychologist, a lot of my colleagues didn't understand what I was doing. They said, mm -hmm. why would you give up this kind of job? Mm -hmm. It's an easy job. Mm -hmm. You're on the same pay scale as the principals. Mm -hmm. You do half the work. Mm -hmm. Why would you give this up? Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't consistent with my spirit. Right. I had to leave. And so then I became an independent school psychologist. So because I am economically independent, that allows me to speak up for the truth. Mm. You see, I don't have contracts, right. long-standing contracts with districts. If they want me to come in and do a job, they will pay me for just that job. But everybody knows going into it that I am going to represent the best interests of the children. That's right. You don't even hire me mm -hmm. if you don't want me to represent the best interests mm -hmm. of the children. Mm -hmm. And if I find mm -hmm. that you're not representing the best then interests of the go children, get them. then I cut them off. What similarities do you see between the public management of the plantations and the, the public management of, of public schools? Well, it's no different. The public school is a plantation. In fact, if you look at the average inner city school district from the, from the air, from an helicopter, it looks just like a slave plantation. You have a couple schools that serve as the big house. Okay, these are where the high achieving students go. Mm -hmm. So you have your white kids, your Asian kids, and then you have black kids who were selected, handpicked to be members of the future bourgeoisie of Minneapolis for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So they deliberately look for the high achieving black children and then they bring them into their fold. Public school is run on the philosophy of more money, more problems. Mm -hmm. The more problems you can create, the more money you're likely to potentially receive. Mm -hmm. So for example, if we take special education, myself as a school psychologist, Whenever I evaluate a child and diagnose them with an educational disability, whether it be speech and language impairment, whether it's learning disabled, intellectual disability, autism, emotional disturbance, the school gets extra money mm -hmm. for that child having that problem. Mm -hmm. Also, if you have a high dropout rate, there's more money for that. If you have a low achievement rate, there's more money for that. So more money, more problems is the operating theory upon which most inner city school districts are run. Mm -hmm. It is an exploitation system that is based off the miseducation of African American children in general and the boys in particular. Since the beginning of time, when a boy doesn't get the attention at home that he needs, he goes to school and tries to get it from the secondary caregiver called the classroom teacher. We all did that. Yeah. If the parents don't give you enough lap time, you go to school to try to compensate. But America's the teachers today, they're not trying to be mother number two or daddy number two. That's right. That's right. They know that the child is crying out for validation from an adult, yeah. but they got better things to do. Yeah. So they're just going to send them to the psychiatrist. But the problem with the psychiatrist is they're in the business of making money by prescribing medication. And the problem with you parents is you got a bad habit of letting school teachers give you mental health advice. Talk about that. A teacher is a teacher. 
And some of them can't even teach well. How dare you give me advice on psychiatric medication? You ain't go to school for psychology. You ain't go to school for psychiatry. But you running around telling parents that I know what that is. That's ADHD. You don't even know the damn criteria for ADHD. So the next time a teacher tells you that your child got ADHD, you tell that teacher that you are an educator. You are not a mental health expert. And the next time you give me mental health advice, I'm going to write a letter of complaint to the superintendent, the chair of the local school board, the United States Department of Education, and the state chancellor, because you are practicing outside of your realm of expertise. Stay in your place. And when we talk about the achievement gap, we're talking about tests that are designed by white educational think tanks mm -hmm. to, uh, to produce a predetermined result. See, when people talk about this test gap, which is only another uh, fancy way or slick way of saying that black kids are intellectually inferior to white children, what you're really talking about is a test that was designed by white people for the benefit of white children and to the detriment of black children. Remember, there are no black test developers. All the tests come out of white supremacist think tank. All of the IQ tests that I give as a psychologist most of them, because we do have some new ones, all of them were created by white racist eugenicists who were proponents of population control and black racial extermination. Let's look at the SAT test. Carl Brigham, the father of the SAT test, was a member of the American Eugenics Society. He advocated racial extermination. He's the father of the SAT test. You will find this across the board for every assessment. The IQ concept mm -hmm. that gave birth to the IQ test mm -hmm. was invented by William Stern, an Adolf Hitler scientist, in 1912. So how can we possibly expect black children to exceed on tests created by racists to produce a racist result? A couple things for parents that they have to stop doing. Number one, they have to stop being apathetic. Schools need to see you. Back to school night, you need to be there. Report card conference, you need to be there because when you don't show up, you send a clear message to the teachers and the school personnel that you don't care about your child and you don't care about their education. And if you don't care, they're not going to care either. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we give them consent yes. to miseducate and abuse by virtue of the fact that we don't participate. Okay. Number two, you should never sign any paperwork that you don't fully understand. It amazes me the amount of black parents I come across who sign permission for their kids to be evaluated for special education just because somebody asked them to. Mm -hmm. Get them tested for ADHD just because somebody asked right. them to. Mm -hmm. You don't do something just because somebody asked you to. You have to think about what the implications are going to be for your child if you go along with this process. Mm -hmm. Many of our boys are being suffering literally to death by feminine energy. Mm -hmm. They have to deal with the reactionary black female energy in the house. And then they have to deal with a reactionary racist white female energy in school. Mm -hmm. And so many of our boys are leaving the school because what they need is men. They want to learn as well as everyone else. Mm -hmm. But the issue is that they're not given an opportunity to be taught by black men strong black men. So this whole problem of miseducation, to some extent, can partially be explained by the absence of masculine energy in the schoolhouse. I'm not telling you not to send your child to college. I'm telling you, you better have a damn good reason for why you do it. Because the only thing you guarantee to get from college now is debt into That's the right. banks. That's right. Some of you are sending some of the laziest black boys ever created to college. <laughs> Taking out a mortgage loan on your house so Raheem could go to Minnesota State University. Listen. But if you could barely get Raheem up for 8 o'clock class in high school, Hello. what makes you think you're going to get himself up for 8 o'clock class Hello. when he's three hours away from home? See? Think about it. See? If you're raising a black boy, your number one responsibility is to do what? Teach him discipline. And what is Dr. Umar's definition of discipline? It is the ability to teach the black boy to do what needs to be done at the precise moment it got to be done, whether he likes it or not. That means he got to be able to turn off LeBron James because he got to test them all. 
I'm getting sick and tired of hearing y'all call me up talking about what's wrong with the current generation. What's wrong with my son? What's wrong with my daughter? Do you know what my answer is? You are. Woo. Stop trying to blame somebody else for the way Raheem and Rashida turned out. Every child is a product of the family system that birthed and raised them. Stop running away from your responsibility. That some of your children show up without the least bit of discipline whatsoever. Some of you parents don't put your child in preschool or daycare, which is fine if you're going to homeschool them, but you don't even do that. And the first time Raheem is expected to sit still for five minutes is at the age of five in kindergarten with a teacher who can care less that it ain't his fault. So I need you parents to do a little bit better job of that pre-academic experience. Because I'm getting sick and tired of seeing little black kids whose only expertise is in reciting Lil Wayne's raps and dancing the latest dance. And black mothers, it's not easy trying to raise a boy on yourself, on your own. And I don't fault none of you. I commend you for the good job that y'all done through this time. But some of y'all got to do a little bit better. Some of you are doing an excellent job with your daughter. Rashida is straight A's and B's. Rashida is a cheerleader. Rashida got a scholarship. Rashida is on her own. Rashida got an after school job. And look at her twin brother Rashid. Don't go to school. Tattoos all on his neck. Straight gangster thug, but that's my baby. <laughs> and one of the hypocrisies that my sisters got to deal with is what? Some of you are raising your sons to be the exact type of man you would never want to marry your damn self. Am I wrong? <laughs> you want. A man who's responsible, but look how you're raising Rashid, irresponsible. You want a man who's a provider, but look how you're raising Rashid. He can't provide for nobody. Look at what you're doing. By not teaching that boy discipline, you are about to destroy somebody's daughter's life. And then when he grows up not to be anything, you say, well, he's just like his father. Father been in jail his whole life. No, he's just like his mother who made him. I was watching the news a couple of weeks ago, and on the news they put up a drug called Risperdal. Risperdal is an antipsychotic that they give to our boys to help control angry behavior because they're getting sick and tired of being mistreated in the school. Well, guess what a group of lawyers found out? They found out that Risperdal has the side effect of raising the amount of prolactin hormone in the bloodstream of boys. Now for my women in here who've ever given birth to a child, you know prolactin is that hormone that increases in your blood postpartum because it helps you grow breasts and lactate. So guess what they found out Risperdal is doing to boys all over America, not just the black ones, all of them. They are literally growing breasts, brothers and sisters. And in some cases dripping milk. Because you need them to be able to sit still long enough to learn about Christopher Columbus. The IQ test does not measure intelligence. That test that I give your child only measures how well they can make it in a white man's world. I'm not being disrespectful. I'm being honest. I'm being honest. Y'all got to get this. Because too few college-educated blacks Come back to teach y'all the truth. Most of them sell you the hell out. Yeah. See, Malcolm told us about the field Negro and the house Negro. But then it was another type of Negro who lived in the field, but used to act like he was in the house. I'm from that bunch.